Well, hello, my name is Dav and I'm the minister of Binfield Free Church and a very warm welcome to you to our YouTube channel and this Sunday morning service for the 10th of May 2020. Thank you so much for tuning in to receive God's word from us and to hear one of God's people leading us in prayer. Now, one of our deacons, Dave, is going to be preaching God's word in a little while, but we'll begin with the 89th Psalm and the first eight verses. That's Psalm 89, verses 1 to 8. Let us receive God's word. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness to in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Amen. This is the word of God. Let us worship God in prayer. Let us pray. Our oh, holy, awesome Lord God Almighty, we praise you and we worship you as the one true living God, eternal Father, eternal Son, eternal Spirit. Father in heaven, thank you that our prayers are coming into your presence in the most holy place right now with your precious Son Jesus at your right hand. Thank you that because of him we can pray to you through his shed blood and by your spirit. We praise you and we thank you that Jesus became a member of the human race. Thank you that he lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. Thank you that he died the death, he took the judgment that we should have received so that we can enter the most holy place by our prayers right now. And Father in heaven, with your son at your right hand now, you are surrounded by millions of angels and we can join in with the angels in praising and worshipping you, these awesome beings, that you are far greater. Who can compare with you? You are greater than everything in all creation. Oh Lord God Almighty, we praise you and we thank you for your love and your faithfulness. And may we know your love and your faithfulness as you speak to us this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our next uh, scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah, the book that we're reading and studying together as a church for the month of May 2020. And this morning's message comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. But to begin with, we'll read Isaiah 5 and verses 1 to 7. Just to highlight that God is just in his judgments and his wrath. And that puts God's amazing grace into perspective. So Isaiah 5, this is 1 to 7 to begin with. Let us receive God's word. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones 
and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. It will break down its walls and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. And then chapter 6, and this is 1 to 13, Isaiah's Commission. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorsteps and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then... One of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, and he had it taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land and uh, our theme for this morning's message is Christ's glory and Isaiah's commission 
So Christ's glory. Why have we entitled it that? Well, if we turn to John chapter 12, for our third brief reading, John's Gospel, and the 12th chapter. And start in at verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfil the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Amen. This is God's word. And may God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. And before Dave preaches God's word to us, let us worship God again in prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are in the highest heaven. We thank you that you rule and you reign from heaven, that nothing is out of your control. Oh, Father in heaven, we praise you and we worship you as the holy God. Oh, Lord God, please help us to live lives that are holy and pleasing and pure to you. Give us grace, empower us by your spirit to do this. And Father in heaven, we do pray that many, many more people on this day will come to praise and worship your holy name as your word is being declared throughout the world. We thank you that faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. As people hear about your son today, may they come to praise your holy name. And Father in heaven, at this time, we do pray for the speedily return of your son. We do cry out this morning, come Lord Jesus, come. We long for the day when your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When your kingdom will be physically established here on earth as it is in heaven. We long for the day of justice. We long for the day when there'll be no more disease, when there'll be no more suffering when there'll be no more death when there'll be no more sin come lord jesus come we pray oh father in heaven we do ask for your help at this time we do thank you that you are our helper oh father in heaven we ask that you would help our government, please give them wisdom. We do thank you for the rulers that you have placed over us. Please give them great wisdom as they have to make difficult decisions on our behalf. And we do pray for us at this time. We do pray that we would joyfully obey all the advice that is given to us for our own good and for the good of others. Oh, Father in heaven, we do pray for those who are ill, that they might know your mercy and the hope of the gospel as they may be facing death right now. Father in heaven, we pray for those who are bereaved. We pray that they will know the comfort and the hope of the resurrection. Oh, Lord God, I pray that they will know your comfort. We thank you that you are the God of all comfort. Oh, Father, we pray for those who are needy and vulnerable. We pray that they might be shielded from infection. And please help us to love them as we love ourselves. 
Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for the NHS and for those who are working to provide medical care. We thank you for those who are working to provide us with essential services. I pray that they would know your help and your strength under immense pressure. Our oh, Father in heaven, we do pray for uh, business owners and employers. I pray that they would act justly towards their employees at this time. Our oh, Father, we do pray for those who are facing the loss of income and livelihood at this time. We pray that their needs would be met by you, Lord God. Our oh, Father in heaven, I pray that we would all know patience, uh, long-suffering and contentment in the face of the inconveniences we face at this time. Oh, Father in heaven, I do pray that you would uh, forgive us uh, for our many, many sins. Maybe during this time of isolation and the quietness, uh, the disappointments and the frustrations, Sometimes we can boil over into anger and maybe bitterness. Oh Lord God, please forgive us for our many, many sins. We have sinned against you in word and thought and deed. Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you that when we do sin, we do have an advocate on high. We thank you for Jesus, uh, whose blood pleads for us, whose blood pleads, Father, forgive. We thank you that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and you forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to forgive those who've sinned against us. Help us to be merciful, just as you've been merciful to us. And Father in heaven, we pray that you'd lead us not into the temptations that are so, so real and so uh, intense during this time of lockdown and isolation and social distancing. Oh Lord God, I pray that you'd lead us not into temptation and that you'd deliver us from that evil one. And we thank you that you have power to do this. Uh, you rule, you reign, you are almighty. And Father in heaven, we thank you that you're a speaking God. Thank you that you speak through your Son and by your spirit. I pray that Christ would preach peace to us now. We thank you for your servant, Dave. We thank you for helping him to prepare this message. And Lord God, I pray that you'd speak in power through his words now. Please challenge us and please change us, Lord God. May we be encouraged and strengthened by Christ. Oh Lord God, please speak for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Dave and it's my privilege to open God's Word for us this morning. We're continuing our reading in the Reading the Bible Together series this morning in the book of Isaiah. And for those of you who are following the series day by day, you've probably got past Isaiah 6 by now. And if you have, I wonder what you made of it. Did you find it useful or challenging or did you just brush over it quite quickly? In studying this passage, it's occurred to me that this is a passage that will definitely challenge us. That's why I asked Dave to read from uh, Isaiah 5 for us before we got to our main reading this morning. Because as we go through that, and as we go through Isaiah, Isaiah we, can, we can see that the book initially seems a bit harsh. But as we'll see, and as we see in this passage, what it really does, that harshness, is illuminates just how amazing the gift of grace that's given through the Lord Jesus Christ really is. The title for this morning's uh, sermon that was put down on the rotor was Christ's Glory and Isaiah's Commission. And I want to pick up on that word commission, because if you're a Christian listening to this today, then you have been given a commission by the Lord Jesus to go and tell the truth of the gospel to the world. But in order to do that, we have to understand some fundamental truths. And those truths are highlighted for us in this short prophetic vision of Isaiah's. This passage, I believe, highlights at least six foundational truths 
that are hallmarks of a true Christian that has been commissioned by God. Hallmarks of true Christian faith. And so if you've ever wondered if you are a Christian, or if you need Christianity at all, or if you sometimes doubt that you've got this Christian thing right, that I would encourage you to look at the six truths that we see in this passage. I'm going to go through each of them explaining what they are and the challenge that they pose for us listening today. So truth number one, turn again to Isaiah 6 if you have a Bible open in front of you. Truth number one, the first few phrases of the passage are a reminder of just how holy and sovereign and mighty and majestic the Lord God really is. You have to read verses one to four a few times to start to get a grip on this. But as we read verse one, it says, In the year the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. When I read that verse, I immediately likened it to seeing the, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. There's a huge statue of Abraham Lincoln sitting down, looking out over the cityscape. And it's quite impressive, to be fair. I'm sure we've all seen it in the films. It draws huge crowds of tourists, and I'm sure it's destroyed in Independence Day at least once. Um, I had the privilege of seeing it in the flesh last year. And when you actually see it in the flesh, you realise it's not really as big as you thought. The films make it out to look huge, and it's impressive, but it's definitely not massive. And so my, my mind going to this, this picture as I think about this vision of God, well, it's a massive underrepresentation of what Isaiah saw. So how big and how majestic was the Lord really in this vision? Well, it says that the train of his robe filled the temple. Let's make an assumption that Isaiah is referring to the main temple in Jerusalem. And then we start to get some idea of scale. Now, Google, being my... Uh, very learned colleague, tells me that the original temple in Jerusalem occupied the same square space as 29 American football fields, which apparently equates to roughly 21 European football fields. So the train of the Lord's robe filled 21 football fields. Now, I don't think that's because the Lord had a, an extreme, lavish, overly sized, ridiculous robe. I think it's because Isaiah was seeing something of the majesty and the scale of God compared to human understanding. Clearly, the Lord God is big. But the verse also highlights that he was high and exalted. The Lord that Isaiah was seeing that day was majestic. He was mighty and he was exalted. It must have been a powerful awe-inspiring, incredible sight. And this is one of the times we can use that word incredible and it not be an exaggeration. Verse 2 then goes on to describe the seraphim flying around above God. The word translated here, seraphim, literally means burning. And I suggest that in this case it doesn't mean that they were on fire, but that they were glowing white hot, like the intensity of the sun that we see. We're told they had three pairs of wings, six in total, and were using one set of wings to cover their feet, one set to cover their face, and one to fly. And verse four goes on to tell us that when these things spoke, the structure of the temple, which would have been an incredibly sturdy building, the structure was shaken. That must have been an amazing sight to behold. Probably a terrifying sight to behold. But how astounding they would have had to have been just highlights how amazing the Lord God is in this vision because look at what those seraphim are doing if we look at verse 3 it says this is referring to the seraphim and they were calling to one another holy 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 is the Lord almighty the whole earth is full of his glory See, as terrifying as these seraphim might be, blazing light with six wings, that must have been, yeah, terrifying. They were simply the messenger boys. They were there 
declaring that the Lord God was holy. They were in awe of him. And they were declaring that the earth, the whole earth, was and is full of his glory. So the Lord God that Isaiah describes for us in these first few verses is an awesome, powerful, mighty, holy, majestic God. He is truly and utterly holy or sacred, as the word holy means, and his glory fills the whole earth. And so it's no wonder Isaiah says what he says in verse five, and we'll, we'll come back to that a bit later. Because first, we have to look at the challenge from these first few verses. Do you always view the Lord God like this? Do you always view him with a reverence that reflects that type of majesty that we see in these first few verses? Those of us that consider ourselves Christians today can very easily focus too much, actually, on the aspect of God as our Father, and he is. The Lord Jesus taught us that we could consider him that, but if we forget, and we touched on this, or Dav touched on this a little bit last week, if we forget that also he is powerful and he is mighty, and if we forget especially that he is this holy, well, then we run that risk of losing the healthy fear of God that we need to have. But what if you don't consider yourself a Christian? How should this challenge you? Well, in a sense, it should challenge you in exactly the same way. If you don't view God as a powerful was this powerful, this holy, then you miss out on the fact that there is a holy judge of all who is going to come back one day to this world and judge the world for every single indiscretion. Every person will be judged for what they have done, good and bad. And if you think you can stand before a judge this holy and mighty and defend yourself, then I have to tell you now, you are wrong. That might sound like an incredibly bleak thing to say, but if we don't understand that, then we won't truly understand the good news of how we can be made right with this majestic judge. We're going to come to that exciting news a bit later, so, so bear with me. The second of our truths that this passage highlights, true Christian faith recognises that we are unclean sinners. The second truth here is, is very closely tied to what I've just been talking about. We are all sinners that deserve to be judged by God. Now, initially, you might find verse five a bit strange because this is a prophet commissioned by God, declaring that he is not worthy. Isaiah is one of the more famous prophets from the Bible. You know, we talk about him all the time at Christmas, don't we? And yet he says he is a sinner. How can that be? In fact, even more so when you look at the language Isaiah uses in these verses, because he's really declaring that he believed he was doomed because he had seen the holiest being in existence and believed himself to be unclean. And the original word used here translates to have a connotation of not just unclean, but foul. He wasn't saying that he was a piece of litter in the street. He was saying that he was silage compared to the Lord. And he used that same word to describe the people around him. So what he was trying to say is that he was a sinful man living amongst sinners, and yet he had seen the Lord. And that terrified him. He says, woe to me in the passage, because he knows what that should mean. It should mean that he is destroyed. Because God is so holy and so powerful that anything sinful that comes into his presence must be destroyed. Isaiah clearly thought this was the end for him. And it's not really that surprising that he felt this way because it was a historical fact that unclean things in God's presence had to be destroyed. If we look at the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6 and verse 6, it tells us an account of where this happened. 2 Samuel 6, verse 6 says, When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God, because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. And therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. This, this guy, Uzzah, simply reached out to steady the ark of the covenant because the oxen had stumbled and the cart that the, uh, the, the ark was on had slipped and the ark 
was apparently going to slip. This man reached out his hand, but the Lord God had to destroy him because this was an act of irreverence to allow sin to touch holiness. It might sound harsh, but Jesus should have known because this had been talked about before. If you turn to Exodus chapter 19 and verse 10. Exodus 19 verse 10 tells us, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. The Lord's presence cannot tolerate any impurity, any sin, and the Lord has to destroy sinful things that enter his presence. And that's why Isaiah is woeful, because he believed that he was about to be destroyed, because he knew he was filthy with sin and had come into the presence of the Holy Lord. It's hard to hear this truth, whether you're a Christian or not, because most of us believe that actually we are good people. But when the requirement to come into the Lord God's presence is perfection, perfection, as in nothing wrong ever, it means that no one is able. The book of Romans tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us is perfect. We have all done things that break God's command to love him with all that we have and to love our neighbours as ourselves. And so none of us can be judged as innocent by this astoundingly powerful and totally holy God. As I say, that's a hard truth to swallow because, well, it is. It's tough. But it's one that sets the context for the greatest news of all time, which the passage then comes to but we're going to skip over that and come to it a bit later for now the challenge we must take from this truth is to ask ourselves if we believe that we come to God as okay as a good person or if we understand how far short of perfection we fall because if we don't grasp for ourselves why Isaiah was woeful then we are simply complacent and we are guilty of thinking that we are good enough which is one of the most dangerous things we can ever allow ourselves to think. Truth number three. True Christian faith recognises that Christians are called to speak what might seem like an unpopular truth. This is the third of our, our six truths, and it comes from verse eight of our passage. Verse eight tells us, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. The key thing here is the word called. This is the voice of the Lord speaking those words. And the Lord himself says, who shall I send? That means something. Think about it this way. If I ask you to do me a favour, you might do it because you're a kind person. And some of you listening, I know are kind people, but you might not do it because it might be really inconvenient. It might break the lockdown that we're currently in right now. But when Matt Hancock recently asked this nation on behalf of the nation for 250,000 volunteers to step forward to support vulnerable people, a job that will require their time, their efforts, probably some of their own money, for no tangible payback. 405,000 people stepped up. What's the difference here? Why is it if it's me asking for help, then people might help if they can, but when a nation asks thousands of people to step up to be inconvenienced, they seemingly flock to do so. Well, it's because of who's asking. And that's what we have to realise here in this passage, that the one who is asking is not a bloke from Bratton. 
He's not even a government official appealing to your sense of patriotism. It is the Lord God Almighty. The Lord who has the power over light and darkness, life and death. The one who commands the sun to keep shining and the stars to twinkle. And the one who keeps every single beat of your heart going. It's the Lord. This is above a royal commission to go and tell this truth, this hard truth, that God is holy and that man is unclean. And we have to go a little bit further than this because it's not just a request from God, like we see in Isaiah, whom shall I send? Because actually, if you're a Christian listening to this today, it's a command for you. It's the command that we see at the end of Matthew's gospel to go and spread the truth to the whole world. And that's the challenge for us from this verse, that we are commanded to go and we must. But there's a sub challenge in there, too. You see, Isaiah on hearing this request doesn't shy away or make Jonah like excuses. He appears to put his hand up and say, here I am. Send me. And the, the fans of grammar in that will notice in that last sentence in the NIV that there's an exclamation mark at the end of it. Which means Isaiah is essentially saying, send me, send me, send me. And we have to ask ourselves, is that our attitude when we think about telling this seemingly hard truth to the world that they are sinners? It's a challenge for us. Truth number four. True Christian faith recognises that the truth will also be rejected by some. This truth is one we have to tell, but it will be rejected by many. And that's a dangerous place for them to be. In some ways, verses 9 to 12 of our passage don't seem to make sense. They appear to be the Lord telling Isaiah to go to the people and tell them the truth of God's holiness and of their own sinful state before him. But with the sole purpose of ensuring that the people do not heed this warning. And do not find a way to be saved from holy judgment. It feels confusing at first. In Isaiah verse nine, or sorry, verse nine, Isaiah is instructed to tell the people that they will hear the Lord's message, but they will never understand it. And in verse ten, it says, "Make the heart of this people calloused." Different translations do translate these in different ways, but it's still a strange one when you first get to it in the different translations too. See, why would the Lord instruct Isaiah to do something that would have his people miss out on salvation? And why, as we go through the Bible, would we see the Apostle Paul, who fought tooth and nail, who went through beatings, imprisonment, hardships beyond any I could ever imagine, for people to believe the message of the gospel? Why would he quote Isaiah 9 and 10 in his speech recorded in Acts 28? More importantly, why would Isaiah 9 and 10 be quoted by the Lord Jesus himself in an account that is featured in every single one of the Gospels? It's featured with the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, verse 14, Mark 4, verse 12, Luke 8, verse 10, and Dav read this for us earlier, John 12, verse 14. Why is this in there? And it doesn't get any clearer as you read verse 10, perhaps. It, it continues as a slightly strange language that says, make their hearts calloused and their eyes dull. And then says, do this so they cannot turn and be healed. What does it mean? Is God really saying, do this so they cannot come back to me? Well, to unpack this conundrum, we have to look at some subtle wording. If you look at verse 9, it says, go and tell this people it's very ding different distinct from my people the people that isaiah was prophesying to and those that the lord jesus spoke to when he told the parable of the sower were not his people and the reason they were not his people is that despite being given every blessing and every opportunity to stay faithful to the lord and despite being part of a nation that was set apart by god for god they had still rejected him. And so this is not God saying that he wanted Isaiah to tell people that they would never be able to understand. Because whilst the Hebrew words here are imperative, 
they are not to be taken as a command. They are a prophetic foretelling of what was going to happen. As I say, this conundrum took a bit of studying and one of the commentators, Joseph Benson, explains this a lot more eloquently than me as he says this. Benson tells us, the Lord is essentially saying to the people through Isaiah that because you have so long heard my words and seen my works and to no purpose and have hardened your hearts and will not learn nor reform, I will punish you in your own way. Your sin shall be your punishment. I will still continue my word and works to you, but will withdraw my spirit so that you will be as unable as you now are unwilling to understand. The Lord is asking Isaiah to make it clear to the people that whilst he is slow to anger and abounding in love, he cannot, he will not tolerate being ignored and dishonoured by those that should be his people. And he will not tolerate those who reject the truth of his salvation plan. True Christian faith recognises that the truth will be rejected by many now, in some ways, there's a perverse encouragement we can take from this truth that we are not failures if we don't convert every single person we speak to. Because not everyone will take this truth and that shouldn't really be an encouragement, but we have to bear that in mind. But there's a challenge here as well. Isn't there? The challenge is that we must try to get through to people how serious this really is, especially to those we care about, because this is life or death stuff. It's what verse 9 and 10 highlights, that rejecting God's word in blindness will lead to eternal despair. These first four truths may have sounded quite heavy and some of them uncomfortable. And, you know, we have to bear in mind that Isaiah was sent by the Lord to prophesy judgment, a righteous judgment, as the passage we heard earlier from Isaiah 5 underlines. And so, the truths that Isaiah spoke were tough truths. And I think it's fair to say, if you had to sum up the, the first few chapters of Isaiah leading to chapter six, it would be fairly accurate to say that Isaiah's point boiled down to declaring woe for those that had forsaken the Lord by not remembering his holiness and his majesty, by continuing as if their sin and lack of faithfulness didn't matter. But within the chapters leading up to this point in the book, there are these little glimmers of hope interspersed between the heavy stuff. And then, and then we get to chapter six and we see two absolutely beautiful truths. Truth number five, true Christian faith recognizes that redemption is given. Truth number five, is found if we jump back to verses six and seven. We know that Isaiah the prophet knew the Lord's holiness or as much as any human can. And we know that Isaiah was terrified by seeing the Lord revealed like this because Isaiah knew that he was not holy enough to come into the Lord's presence. And so he was likely to die or at least based on what he knew of history, he was likely to be destroyed for entering the Lord's holy presence. But in the midst of this moment of awe and then horror, this happens in verse six. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. One of these terrifying, shining seraphim takes a coal from the altar and flies to Isaiah. Now, I think it's safe to assume that this coal was hot because it had just come out of a fire on the altar and the angelic being had, had to use tongs to remove it from the altar. And the angelic being takes this coal and touches Isaiah's mouth. On the face of it, that hasn't actually got any less scary really, has it? But when you look at what it signified and what the seraphim then says, you see that this is the most wonderful thing Isaiah has ever heard and will ever hear. And why do I say that? 
Well, this coal came from the place of sacrifice, the altar, the place where the Lord God had told Israel, the nation to which Isaiah was a prophet, that they had to make atonement for their sins. This is a signal that a sacrifice was part of what comes next. And what is it that came next? Well, the seraphim touches Isaiah's mouth with this live coal. Isaiah had declared only moments earlier that he was a man of unclean lips. His lips or his mouth were the source of his sin and uncleanliness. And this seraphim takes the coal from the place of sacrifice to the source of the sin. And then the seraphim goes on to say, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The seraph brings something from the place of sacrifice that pleads forgiveness of sins and takes it straight to the source of sin. And because of that, Isaiah's guilt is taken away because his sins are forgiven. Isaiah no longer had to fear standing in the Lord's presence because he had been made holy. And notice that Isaiah didn't do anything to earn or deserve this forgiveness. All he did was simply declare that he was unworthy to be there because he was a sinner. The truth of what we read in Isaiah 6 verses 6 and 7 was for him. But my friends, this is a prophecy of truth for the Lord Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a truth that we can seek for ourselves. You see, the Lord Jesus went to the place of sacrifice on the cross. He became that live coal that was burned up or given up so that he could get to the source of our uncleanliness, take our sins away and banish our guilt. That is truth number five. That as though we deserve nothing from the Lord, he gives redemption. He gives it to us through the sacrifice of his son on the cross. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a myth. This is the truth of life. And yes, it was a prophecy when Isaiah first wrote it. But the Bible tells us that in the book of Romans, in chapter five and verse eight. Chapter five, verse eight of Romans says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible tells us Christ died for us whilst we were still unclean. So that Romans five, verse nine, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath by him, through him? So Christ died for us so that we can be justified through Christ. And if we are, then that means this from Romans 5 verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That means we are reconciled to the Lord God. Truth number five is that although we deserve nothing from the Lord God, he gives redemption to us through the sacrifice of his son. And he does this to reconcile us to him, to make us part of his own family. If you're a Christian listening to this, then that fact should give you so much joy. It should give you so much strength, even if you have heard it millions of times. But what if you're not? What if you've never said to the Lord, Lord, I am unworthy to be in your presence. You are unimag unimaginably more holy than I, and I deserve destruction. But will you save me, Lord, by your grace and through your risen son, the Lord Jesus? What if you've never said that? Well, the good news is, if you do say that to the Lord, the Bible also tells us this in Romans in chapter 10 this time, verse 13. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you ask the Lord for it, then forgiveness and redemption, the, the forgiveness and redemption we see in verses six and seven of today's passage will be given to you. There's no hidden clauses. There's no terms and conditions that you have to go to a website to read. It's given. Perhaps though you don't want to believe this, well, if that's you, then can I ask you to do something for me? Find a copy of the Bible and read Isaiah's chapter one to Isaiah chapters one to five. 
and see what the option of ignoring God's grace could mean. Or will mean, should I say. And if you don't have a copy of the Bible, our email address is on the Binfield Free Church website. Email us. We will get a Bible to you. Truth number six, our final truth this morning. True Christian faith recognises that with God, hope always remains. The final truth of the six we're looking at from this passage is that the Lord is faithful. And that means that there is always hope. Now, verse 13 is still a tricky one because it does say that even the few who are left of God's people will be subject to hardship and destruction. But it also says that a stump will remain. We had a large tree in our back garden a few years ago and we, we had to have it chopped down. It was going to pose a risk at some point. And the team of guys that chopped it down took it down to the stump. That's all we paid them to do. And so at that point, they had to put treatments, chemicals on the stump to stop it growing because it would have continued to grow despite being chopped down. And that stump is like the stump that is left of God's people. Because out of that stump will always spring new life. And out of God's chosen people, the people that Isaiah was prophesying to, came a lady called Mary a few generations later. You might have heard of her because you see Mary found favour in the eyes of the Lord and the Lord gave her a son and she and her husband were told to call this son Jesus because as Matthew 1 and verse 21 tells us he will save their, his people from their sins. From a stump of people that would suffer further judgments after Isaiah had died and long gone came not just the hope of a nation of Israel but the one who gives redemption from sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this shows that we can trust that the Lord is faithful because he had promised to do this, to send a deliverer, to give us a way back to him, to that right relationship with him, to that holiness we need to be with him. He promised that and he delivered upon it. Despite every period of disobedience from his chosen people and every righteous judgment, the Lord never gave up on his plan to restore his people to him. And so we can trust in the Lord God's faithfulness. I'm not going to label that as a challenge from this passage, but I think an encouragement with which to finish our six truths. So we've looked at these six truths from Isaiah 6. These six truths are ones that we must recognise and hold to if we want to carry out the commission we have been given. These truths are that we recognise that God is holy and righteous, that we recognise that we are unclean sinners, that we recognise that we are called to tell the message, and that we recognise that it will be rejected. But that we also recognise that the truth, that grace is given by the Lord to those that recognise that they have fallen short of God's standards and simply call out to him to make them righteous. And finally, that we recognise that hope always remains if we trust in the Lord God. If you recognise these truths in your own faith, then you have the foundations of true Christian faith. And you are well on your way in your commission. Keep going. It is a journey. If you recognise some, but not all of these in your faith, then please keep going. I'd suggest keep reading Isaiah prayerfully. And if you don't recognise any of these things in your faith, but you want to understand them for yourself, then in faith, by faith, ask the Lord God to reveal these truths to you. And he will. Let's pray. Our Sovereign Father, we praise you that you are majestic and holy and mighty. We praise you because you are greater than we can ever imagine. We long to see one day you face to face and see how glorious you are. Forgive us, Lord, that we have fallen short of the glory of God. Way, way short. Lord, forgive us that we put the gulf between us and you but praise you and thank you that grace is given through the Lord Jesus Christ we are given redemption that we are called into your family 
we praise you for that. We praise you that you have done that. And you've given us a hope for today, for tomorrow, for eternity. Glory be unto you for your grace, your goodness, and your majesty. In Jesus' name we pray, we praise you, and we thank you that we can. Amen. Thanks for listening. God bless you.